So far away, Lulu. It's time to get bonely. <sighs> Bone. Fine. Yes. Oh, no, the skeleton's falling over. There we go. Bones is a police procedural about a bone-obsessed lady who teams up with a former sniper turned FBI agent to solve various skeleton-related crimes using her extensive knowledge of the human anatomy and her skills at shooting men in the penis from very far away. The show is also notable for being sold by Fox to itself to avoid paying any royalties to the cast and crew. So far away, Lulu. What do you know about Bones? Far too much, because you're freaking obsessed with the show. I am obsessed with the show, Bone, because I love bad, gimmicky police procedurals. And my love of this started with, I think, just the progenitor of that genre, The X-Files. And there are so many TV shows that follow that exact format of two very fuckable leads solving crimes and mysteries. Like, so you think about it, there's like, um, there's Bones, there's that show Castle, there's Lie to Me, uh, there is The Mentalist, <laughs> there is The Sniffer, and the connective thread between them all is just two very attractive co-stars and the will they, won't they, as they solve crimes. Oh look, it's another square-drawed brunette man with a tall, beautiful lady. Hmm, I wonder if they're gonna date. And that's the thing about Bones, though, because they do almost immediately. They, they get bonely almost immediately. <laughs> and my favourite thing is, in the later seasons, uh, <laughs> David Boreanaz's character still calls his wife Bones. <laughs> like he's married to her, he's like, come on Bones, and she's like, what? He calls me Bones, even though I'm his wife and the mother of two of his children, he still refers to me by a nickname I despise. Okay, so what's this about them selling the show to themselves? Well, at a certain point in the life cycle of Bones, around the time it became one of the most popular TV shows on the air, um, a couple of members of the principal cast and a few executive producers inked a deal with Fox um, to get some money on the back end from syndication rights and the like. And you think hearing that, the people who signed that deal would have made a pretty big chunk of change from all those syndication rights. But as it turns out, nobody earned a single thin cent from any of those deals, which much annoyed the show's cast and executive producers. So how much money would they have earned? We don't quite know because... Uh, in the subsequent lawsuit, which we'll get to in a moment, that um, arose from this, um, Fox spent all of the time muddying the waters on how valuable the show actually was. And they claim that Bones was, and I quote, a middling show with middling ratings. And I'm sure you agree with the former part of that sentence, because <laughs> you're not a fan of this show. Well, the latter is absolutely categorically false. I mean, it's even funnier for me because, like, I was, you know, living in America when they were, like, airing this show, like, new mm -hmm. episodes. They were pushing that shit all the time. Yeah, and yet... It was, were, like, prime time. And they were simultaneously arguing that it made no money to avoid paying them, uh, the show's stars and its producers, any of the royalties they were rightfully owed. And Fox are not unique for doing this, and there is actually a term to describe this exact thing, and it is... Hollywood accounting, and that is a term used to describe a very creative way of cooking the books on productions of shows and movies so that they never technically earn a profit. And a couple of the more famous examples of that are uh, the film Star Wars, which according to Fox, uh, never earned any money. And they actually sent a couple of the film's stars a letter every single year telling them they weren't owed any royalties yet because Star Wars hadn't turned a profit. And that's just really depressing because one of those people was David Prowse who played Darth Vader and that guy got shat on from orbit almost his entire working life. And he would frame the, uh, the letters he got from Fox telling him that one of the most successful famous movies of all time hadn't earned any money. <laughs> Moving swiftly on, we have the Lord of the Rings series. And how much money do you think that made, Lulu? Um, a lot. Well, you'd be wrong there because according to the studio, it was actually a catastrophic failure that earned them no money. And they said that so they wouldn't have to pay all of the film stars any money because they signed similar deals. Oh my God. Then you have Forrest Gump, which earned and adjusted for inflation $1.1 billion at the box office on a $100 million budget. And uh, despite this, uh, the studio still claimed that earned no money. And they said that so they wouldn't have to pay the author of the original book, Winston Groom, any royalties. And we've got a video on that that you can go watch if you're interested. Almost every single movie in history has lost money on paper. And for anyone curious about how exactly this works, there's a video for today I found out uh, that I wrote so that you can go watch and that explains it in more detail. But suffice to say, it's fucked up and actors don't like it. Money laundering, but let's make it sparkly. Hollywood accounting. That's basically what it is, yes. 
And it's, it's really smart in a way, but it's also fucked up because they use like the allure, the promise of profit sharing to hoodwink actors. So it's like, you know, David Boreanaz and Emily Deschanel, they were convinced to take lower salaries in return for potential earnings on the back end, which they did not get because Fox told them, Bones isn't making any money. We're going to renew it for a 12th season and pay $2 million per episode and advertise the living fuck out of it, but we're not going to pay you because it's obviously a failure. It's like, if it's a failure, why are you pro... And it's like, it's, it's so obvious what they were doing, but they get away with it because the numbers don't lie. I'm imagining them having, like, the executives having a meeting with the actors being like, yeah, look, you know, we're facing budget cuts because it's just not making any money. We're going to have to start using plastic skeletons instead of the real ones. <laughs> the thing is, though, they have so many skeletons on that show. Like, just <laughs> the amount of fake skeletons they brought in for all the promo images of Elmy Deschanel hugging a skeleton. Like, every season has a different promo image of David Boreanaz and Emily Deschanel hugging a skeleton. Okay, so for the longest time, I actually got this show and Jennifer Love Hewitt's show, Ghost Whisperer, confused. Because, because Emily Deschanel's always fondling a skeleton. And I was like, oh, is it like a supernatural type of thing? Like she connects to them? It and it's like, no. No, no, you say that. But you don't know how fucking batshit insane this show gets because I have watched a lot of Bones in preparation for this specific video because I wrote this six months ago and no other member of the channel wanted to like work on it with me. And the I mean, re <laughs> I don't either. <laughs> but you need to know about the fucking 9-11 skeleton. <laughs> because I don't! I know about it because I watched it with you. Like <laughs> No, you I didn't. That's the thing. You watched the episode with the JFK skeleton. You didn't. Oh, know, you don't know about the 9/11 skeleton. So there's an episode of Bone, and it's one of those. It's a very special episode where they find a skeleton, and they're like, "Well, this is a homeless dude who gives a fuck." And then they like date the bones. And go, wait a minute, this guy died on 9/11, and it's like 9/11 skeleton. Let's go. Oh my God. 9/11. Oh my God. And then like the one that you watch with me is the JFK episode because the character that um, David Boreanaz plays is called Seely Booth. And it turns out he is a direct descendant of John Wilkes Booth. No. <laughs> that's a, that's a plot point. And he doesn't like that. And the reason he's joined the FBI is to regain his family honor and to prove that this skeleton is not JFK, they have to recreate the JFK assassination. No. <laughs> on a skeleton. Oh. remember this i don't remember a single plot point of that show other than the chocolate bar skeleton because <laughs> i just kind of mentally checked out after the fucking chocolate bar skeleton <laughs> no. the shit accidentally falls it like oh my god the thing is though that means, though, you you were checked out by the time they start QR coding skeletons and there's a guy who's hacking skeletons. <laughs> and he, like, it laser engraves computer viruses into skeletons and hacks into the FBI using skeletons. It's some kind of fractal pattern. Whoever did this wrote malware on bone that, that took down a million bucks worth of computers. I like how you're telling me this as if you've not told me this like five times now. And you don't listen. Like, oh, I... <laughs> Look, Lulu, 9-11 skeleton. You tell me that's not a plot point. That's at the very least got you a bit intrigued. Other boyfriends text their girlfriends about how work is going and how the things they're hey, doing with their work. friends. And then Carl is just sending me possums. And oh my God, did you know this happened on Bones? <laughs> There's a 9-11 skeleton. The worst one, the one that blew my mind is that the guy who plays Lance Sweets wrote Spider-Man? Yeah, yeah, no, you were on that for quite a while. Yeah, it's like, Joe, something else I found recently that blew my fucking mind. It's not going to mean much to you, but someone in the audience is going to lose their shit at this. Uh, the guy who voices Senator Armstrong in Metal Gear Revengeance is the voice of Mimia in God of War. And that means nothing to you, but someone out there has just booted up IMDB to make, uh, to make sure I'm not telling porkies. So have fun with that one. But do you want to hear about how Fox got Boundly? 
Stop saying that. What does that even mean, Carl? You've well, said bonely in 10 different contexts in this video alone. Yes. What does it mean? It means whatever you need it to mean. Like, whatever the situation requires, bonely is there. Anyway, so uh, while Fox were arguing that Bones was a horrible disaster that no one watched, um, on Hulu alone, 2 million people a week were tuning in. And that leads us to how Fox ended up pissing off the cash just a little bit too much. So wait, what does Hulu have to do with this? Well, what happened is Fox sold the exclusive worldwide streaming rights to Bounds to Hulu for basically nothing. And all the people who signed those profit sharing deals mentioned earlier were very annoyed about this because it was an obvious attempt by Fox to weasel out of paying the many royalties because the less they sold the show for, the less they would inevitably out. And uh, for anyone out there who likes the numbers, um, in advertising revenue on Hulu, the entire show made about a million dollars. Uh, which pissed the cast off because one season of the show earned 70 times that on TV. Meaning that it's very obvious that the show is worth more than Hulu paid for it. Would you like to hazard a guess at how this went in court for Fox? Uh, I'm gonna hope not well, but... Yes. Mm. You are right, it did not go well for Fox because uh, when the uh, collected cast and crew decided to sue Fox and the case was taken to court, it very quickly emerged that things were not on the up and up because... <laughs> Uh, someone just did some digging and realised that, oh, Fox own a 30% stake in Hulu. <gasps> so in effect, Fox were paying themselves to take Bones off their hands. Uh, so they figuratively signed both sides of the deal, which isn't even the worst part, because it turns out they literally signed both sides of the deal, because when they managed to get a copy of the contract signed by Fox and Hulu um, during the court case, they discovered that the same executive had signed both sides. Oh my god. Like, it could not have been more nakedly transparent what they were trying to do. Like, a guy from Fox literally signed both sides of the contract while representing both Fox and Hulu. God, but it's like kind of scary how lazy that is because clearly there's a precedent of them getting away with this. Well, I think they did get away with it and they likely would have continued to get away with it um, if they'd have not, like, you know, just charged themselves with a laughably low ball offer which completely cut out all the people who signed on to those profit sharing schemes. They sold it for like a little bit more and the cast and crew had got a little bit of money, they'd been okay, but they got nothing and they were pissed off, rightfully so. And uh, while Fox tried to argue that they'd not done anything wrong, the courts disagreed and slapped them with a $179 million fine because fuck them. Good. So Emily De Chanel and David Boreanaz, they got paid. Good for them. Mm -hmm. Good for them. Good for them, good for Bones. So far away, Lulu, I know that you don't like Bones, right? Uh. But would you like to like hear a few facts that will make you, if not like Bones, like the cast? I guess. Yeah, well, um, during my research, you know, because when I was trying to write as many articles on Bones as I could, so we could talk about it on the channel, I found out that Emily Deschanel and Michelle Conlin, who plays Angela in the show, they're best friends in real life. Aww. So the friendship they have on the show is real, and they are best friends in real life, as is um, Emily Deschanel and David Boreanaz. And that's one of those things where you kind of hope it's the case for every show, but you know the reality is that they probably don't hang out all that much because they're all working actors, but just to know that the main cast of that show are all good friends in real life makes those interactions seem a lot more genuine to me. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, like, that's one of the biggest things that people like about Scrubs. Mm -hmm. It's the, the friendship between JD and Turk. Like, they're real friends in real life, and that chemistry is present on screen. And even if you don't like the show Bones, like, you know, the chemistry between those characters is part of what draws me to it. It's the same reason, like, all the shows of that ilk um, draw people in. So there's ensemble casts of likeable characters. In a similar vein, are there any, like, side characters from TV shows that you're a particular fan of? Because I'm going to mention my man, Tony Shalhoub, from The Amazing <laughs> Miss Maisel. <laughs> A show me and you watched, and I continue to watch for Tony fucking Shaloub. Just like, if we can, can we please put a clip in of just Tony Shaloub and his long johns doing exercise? Oh my god, go! He's <laughs> fucking you incredible. <laughs> and don't be chicken again. No, don't be chicken again. Just Tony Shaloub, man. A lot of things are because I fucking love monks. So I was like, oh, Tony Shaloub. Hell yeah, get him in. So in that vein, any like side characters in TV shows that like, you know, similarly steal the show for you, or that you watch the show for them and not the main character? Does Spencer Reed count? Yes. I don't know. Yeah, he does. He's just adorable. Or like the little things they'll just like throw in, like mm. once in a while. By the end of that fucking show, like what was like Spencer Reed done? Everything. 
They get him addicted to drugs. They kill his girlfriend in front of him. His mom has schizophrenia. His dad abandoned him. They send him to jail in a later season for something he didn't do. Yeah. <laughs> like, that poor boy. <laughs> well, it's, like that, it's that old trope, isn't it? Like, can you name a character who's suffered more? And, like, you know, the, and everyone always posts, like, a picture of Guts from Berserk. But then you have, like, Spencer Reed. And, like, recently, like, Phil Mitchell for us. Like, we did a wiki weekend on, like, soap star Phil Mitchell. And just like, he gets hit by like five cars. <laughs> he's been on like a soap for 30 years. So obviously every Christmas he has to have like a tragedy befall him. And just recently in um, the, the group chat we've got for playing Smash Bros, we just keep posting that clip of just filming. You don't know anything about him, so like, it's a soap. And he's a East London gangster. And it's just him addicted to crack saying, I need my crack. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, but he's like this really red faced baked bean man. So actually, yeah, you, you've never seen Phil Mitchell, have you? No! Google Phil Mitchell EastEnders and tell me how much that man looks like a baked bean. How much that man looks like a baked bean. See, like, you're going to Google it and then you're going to laugh. I know it. <laughs> <laughs> he wants his crack. You, you, you need a doctor. You, you need professional help. What, what I need is... What I need is crack. I'm now going to blow your mind and tell you that in the 1990s, that character and that actor was a sex symbol in the UK. I'm not, like, my mind is not particularly blown because, like, I've had the food there. You guys have no taste. We don't know. But you know what? Phil Mitchell needs his crack. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. We just kept laughing about it. We just kept giggling. And the thing is, because this one thing where it's handled so poorly in the show. Do you know, like, TV shows always handle those issues so poorly. Like, we talk about Bone, like the 9-11 skeleton. And of course, every character in the show has to know someone who died on 9-11. And it's like, they have multiple episodes where like, um, they keep revealing that like, Booth, like when he was a soldier, like he was in like every combat encounter known to man. And he talks about, yeah, I was in Desert Storm. Um, I know people who like, it's like, how do you know everybody? <laughs> and they always have to like, have a character have a direct connection to that, um, uh, to those tragedies. And it's like, I've not gotten to the season yet, but didn't you tell me they did that in Criminal Minds where there's a character who's like, their whole story is just 9-11? Oh my god, wait, actually, ironically, that character's played by Jennifer Love Hewitt, the Ghost Whisperer. <laughs> and isn't it just her character is like, 9-11 happened? And just everything is like, connected to 9-11. I'm not a patriot, like, I'm not a particularly like, flag hugger patriotic person, but that just feels so gross. Now, like, there'll never be though, any piece of media that did 9-11 more dirty than that um, Robert Pattinson movie where it ends where it gets 9 11. <laughs> and that, I'm not making it up, that's literally how the movie ends. It's a romantic comedy where it gets 9 11. It's, it's like this somber, like, coming of age, like, romance story about this guy who, like, doesn't know where he's going in his life. And then as he's, like, staring out into the distance, it zooms out, <gasps> he's in the Twin Towers. Like, it couldn't be more offensive unless the post credit scene was his hand emerging from the rubble. Like Freddy Krueger or some fuck. Stop it, movies and TV shows. Stop it. <laughs>